Thank you. <laughs> All right, the HNGCOA reductase inhibitors, those are your statins. Your torvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, those end in statins, and they're known as the statin drugs. Therapeutic actions and indications, they lower the cholesterol. Remember, your, your, you have your HDL and your LDL. The HDL is a good cholesterol. That's the one you want to be high. That's why it starts with an H, right? And the LDL, you want to be low. That's your bad cholesterol. Your LDL, your triglycerides, you want them to be low. Provostatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin, they're indicated for patients with documented coronary artery disease. Remember, guys, that coronary artery, that is the one that brings blood, oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, everything that the heart muscle itself needs. That's the one that provides all of those to the heart. So anyone with documented coronary artery disease, they can get these drugs to slow the progression of the disease because remember what the cholesterol does, it sticks to the inner lining of those coronary arteries. It decreases blood flow and sometimes it can even cause obstruction and the patient has a heart attack. These three agents and a torvastatin are used, look at this guys, to prevent a first MI in patients who have multiple risk factors for developing coronary artery disease. We talked about those risk factors last week. That's important for you guys to know. Pharmacokinetics. The statins are well absorbed in the GI tract. They undergo first pass metabolism in the liver. They're excreted, they're excreted through the feces and urine. So that's how they get out the body. Contraindications and cautions for the statins. Obviously, any patient that has an allergy to statins, or look at this, guys, to fungal byproducts or compounds. It's contraindicating anyone with active liver disease or history of uh, alcoholic liver disease. Because remember, guys, how it's metabolized through that liver. It's contraindicated in anyone that's pregnant, that's breastfeeding, page 822. And look, these drugs are labeled as pregnancy category X. That mean under, means under no circumstances should we give this drug to a pregnant person. Remember you have your A, B, C, D, then you have your X. You laughing at me? No, oh. over here. So at least with, you know, drugs that are uh, category um, D, we may give it if we have to, but we know that those drugs are known to cause abnormalities in the fetus. When it comes to category X, it absolutely will cause an abnormality if it does not cause a, a, a miscarriage, okay? So you need to know that we do not give to pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding. Atorvastatin levels are not affected by renal disease, but patients with renal impairment who are taking other statins require close monitoring since rhabdomyolysis, a potential adverse effect, is associated with these drugs and can be harmful to the kidneys. Guys, this is important for you to know, it's not only on the NCLEX for RN, it's actually on the NCLEX for NP as well. So for RN, if you guys get a question on this, it's usually something like a patient has been newly prescribed a statin and they'll give one of the statins and it's a couple weeks in and they call and they say, you know, I don't know what's wrong. I've really been having pain in my left calf or my right calf. You better tell them to come in immediately because this drug has been known to cause rhabdo and we want to make sure that's not what's going on with them here. Um, caution should be used in patients with impaired endocrine function because of the potential alteration in the formation of steroid hormones. Let's talk about adverse effects of the statins. The most common adverse effects associated with the statins for the GI system, flatulence. What's flatulence? Yes. 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 Who said farting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're nursing student guys, gas, <laughs> abdominal pain, cramps, nausea, vomiting, constipation. The CNS effects, headache, dizziness, blurred vision, insomnia, fatigue, cataract development. Remember guys, cataract, sorry, sorry. That's that opacity of the lens, right? 
cataract development and may reflect changes in cell membrane and synthesis of cholesterol itself. Again, rhabdomyolysis. This is the second time they're letting us know patients who take this drug, an adverse effect is rhabdo and we need to watch out for it. Rhabdomyolysis, a breakdown of muscles with waste products can injure the glomerulus and cause acute renal failure has also occurred in the use of all of these drugs. You see that word all? All of the statins. So when you hear that word statin, when you see a medication that's a statin, one of the first things that you need to think about in the back of your mind is rhabdo. Rosuvastatin is associated with increased occurrence of rhabdomyolysis in Asian American patients. And that should be taken into consideration when you're picking a statin for those patients. Drug-drug interactions. Again, we're seeing that R word again. The risk for rhabdomyolysis increases if any of these drugs is combined with, here's a list, erythromycin, cyclosporin, genfibrozo, niacin, or antifungal drugs. Such combinations should be what? Avoided. Because taking a statin alone already puts that patient at risk from uh, rhabdomyolysis. Now, if they take with any of these drugs, this patient's almost sure to get rhabdo, which we don't want to happen. So if we see that the patient's on a statin and the doctor orders one of these meds, are you going to give it blindly or you're going to hold that medication, call the doctor up? Hold it. Hold it. Increased serum levels and resultant toxicity can occur if the drugs are combined with digoxin or warfarin. If this combination is used, the serum digoxin levels and or clotting times should be monitored carefully. By the way, what's the normal digoxin level? 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. Very good, 0. 0.5 to 2. Increased estrogen levels can occur if these drugs are taken with oral contraceptives. Serum levels and risk of toxicity increase if the drugs are combined with grapefruit. We don't like grapefruit when it comes to pharmacology, do we? No. no. All right. Next page. This is important for you guys to know. Take a look at box 47.7. Make sure you guys know this. Patients who are taking HMGCOA inhibitors, those statins, need to be cautioned against, uh, excuse me, need to be cautioned to avoid drinking grapefruit juice while taking these drugs. So do you think the author's telling you this a second time just for the health? This is important, guys. It's been seen on NCLEX. Make sure you know it. Grapefruit juice alters the metabolism of the drugs, leading to increased serum level of the drug and increased risk for adverse effects, such as the potentially fatal rhabdomyolysis. All right, nursing considerations for the HMGCOA reductase inhibitors. Again, any allergies to the statins, any allergies to uh, fungal byproducts, if the patient has a history of liver disease or alcohol liver disease, if they're pregnant, if they're breastfeeding, if they have impaired endocrine function. Important things you're gonna do for that patient, you make sure that you weigh the patient, you want a baseline. Assess their neurolog neurological status, make sure you take their vital signs. Inspect the abdomen for distension and auscultate of bowel sounds. You're gonna assess their elimination patterns because remember how this drug's excreted through the urine and the feces. Make sure you uh, pay attention to those lab tests. Implementation rationale. Look at this. You're going to administer this drug when? At bedtime. You're going to give it at bedtime, and you're going to administer a torvastatin at any time during the day. So all those other statins you give at bedtime, but the torvastatin you can give any time during the day. You're going to monitor their cholesterol level, especially the LDL, because we want the LDL to go up or down. Yeah. Down. Very good. You're going to arrange for periodic opth you guys, I can't speak. ophthalmic examinations because remember one of those possible adverse effects is the glaucoma. I'm glaucoma, cataract, sorry, is a cataract. So we want to make sure that their vision's not being affected. You're going to do liver function tests, you know, the ALT, the AST, the triglycerides, LDL, HDL, all that good stuff. Page 824. Ensure the patient's attempted a cholesterol-lowering diet and exercise program for at least three to six months before 
beginning therapy. Remember guys, in nursing, we're always going to go from least invasive to most invasive. So we're always going to try, you know, diet, exercise first. Teach them about lifestyle changes. We went over that last week. You're going to withhold lovastatin, atorvastatin, or fluvastatin in any acute serious medical condition, such as infection, hypotension, a major surgery or trauma, metabolic uh, disorders, seizures, etc. Because myopathy can develop and we're still concerned about um, the, the kidneys. You're going to teach them to use a barrier contraceptive because can this patient take this medication if they're pregnant? No. No. Provide comfort measures, support and encouragement. Key points. Avoid pregnancy and make sure you report any sudden, ding, 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 isn't that the key word? Sudden muscle pain, especially if a common, a, accompanied by fever. Cholesterol absorption inhibitors. All right, so for cholesterol absorption inhibitors, you guys see the drug um, using, I'm going to try to pronounce the drug, acetamide as an adjunct with a statin may help lower the LDL cholesterol and further decrease the risk of cardiovascular events. Therapeutic actions and indica indications for the cholesterol absorption inhibitors. They decrease the absorption of dietary cholesterol from the small intestine. Contraindications. Obviously, if a patient has allergies to cholesterol absorption inhibitors, they're not going to give it, or any component of those drugs. It is used in combination, again, with a statin. This is the se second time that they're telling us that we use acetamide, that cholesterol absorption inhibitor, we use it as adjunct. Whenever you see that word adjunct, that means in addition to together with something else. It's not given by itself. So this is the second time that they're letting us know that it's given in combination. If it's used in combination with a statin, it should not be used during pregnancy or lactation. We're not gonna give it to elderly patients, patients with liver disease. Adverse effects, mild abdominal pain and diarrhea, headache, dizziness, fatigue, upper respiratory tract infection, back pain, muscle aches, and pains. Drug-drug interactions. The risk of elevated serum levels for azetamine increases if it's given with cholecystamine, phenofibrate, gemfibrozil, or antacids. If these drugs are used in combination, azetamine should be taken at least two hours before or four hours after the other drugs. Don't ever give them together. The risk for toxicity increases if azetamide is combined with cyclosporine. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin, yes. Warfarin levels increase in the patient who's also taking azetamide. All right, so nursing considerations for the patients taking cholesterol absorption inhibitors. You're going to assess them for allergies to any component of the drug, liver dysfunction, advanced age. Remember, we don't want to give this to elderly patients. We don't want to give it to anyone that's pregnant or lactating. You're going to do a physical assessment on the patient. Monitor orientation and reflex. Monitor re respirations and auscultate the lungs. Inspect the abdomen for distension and auscultate bowel sounds. You're going to check the lab results. Implementation rationale. You're going to monitor serum cholesterol triglycerides and LDL levels before, because remember we need a baseline so we can know if the drug's being effective or not, or not, and periodically during therapy. Monitor liver function tests, page 826. Ensure the patient has attempted a cholesterol lowering, lowering diet and exercise program for at least several months before beginning therapy. Remember, we always want to start from least invasive. Diet and exercise first. Teach them about lifestyle changes, same lifestyle changes you guys learned for coronary artery disease last week. Again, they need to be, wear barrier contraceptive. When they say barrier contraceptive, what are they talking about? Oh, Condoms. Because remember, a lot of these drugs, guys, they mess with the oral um, contraceptive. So if the woman's taking oral birth control, she's going to mess around and get pregnant without wanting to, right? 
teach them comfort measures. You're going to support and encourage them and provide patient teaching. Key points. Again, cholesterol absorption inhibitors, azetamib, works in the brush border of the what part of intestines? The small intestine to prevent absorption of dietary cholesterol. God bless you. Change in diet and increased exercise are important parts of overall treatment. And on the side, I wrote primary prevention because NCLEX is very big on that. They expect you to know the difference between primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. You guys know what those are. So you need to understand that that teaching is a form of primary prevention. Okay. Um, the PCSK9, you guys can read that on your own. Let's move to fibrates, page 828. Everyone there? Yes. All right. The fibrates stimulate breakdown of lipoproteins from the tissues and their removal from the plasma, which is the blood. They lead to a decrease in lipoprotein and triglyceride synthesis and secretion. So these guys are your fibrates, your... Um, Phenofibrate, gem fibrozil, phenofibric acid. Just make sure that you know those drugs fall under the fibrates. Vitamin B. Vitamin B, also known as niacin. By the way, guys, when I've seen these questions on NCLEX, they, it's on niacin. They don't ever say vitamin B. So you do need to understand that when you see niacin, it's vitamin B that they're talking about, okay? All right, so vitamin B known as niacin or nicotinic acid, that also, it inhibits the release of free fatty acids from fatty tissue. Niacin is associated with intense cutaneous flushing, nausea, abdominal pain, making its use somewhat limited. Who wants to experience that? It also increases the serum levels of uric acid. So the minute that you see that this increases uric acid, immediately what are you thinking about? Yeah. Gout, yes. And may predispose the patient to development of gout. Niacin is often combined with bile acid sequestrants for increased effect. It's given at bedtime to make sure that the maximum use of the nighttime cholesterol synthesis, and it has to be given four to six hours after the bile acid sequestrant, because remember, they usually give it um, these two drugs together. But when I say together, not like at the same time. So the niacin is gonna be given four to six hours after the bile acid sequestrant is given for better absorption. All right, let's talk about omega-3 fatty acids. <laughs> Um, omega-3 fatty acids, they're a combination of omega-3 fatty acids and activator that inhibits. So it stops liver enzyme systems to decrease the synthesis of triglycerides, which is a type of cholesterol. Now look what it says here. It should be combined with appropriate diet and exercise always. Met this, these meds never take the place of diet and exercise. It's always going to be adjunct. Okay, with appropriate diet and exercise to help keep overall lip lipid levels low. It is not recommended in pregnancy and lactation. It can prolong bleeding time, so caution must be used with any other drug that affects bleeding. Remember, those drugs that affect bleeding, aspirin, anticoagulants, your coumadin, right? Diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, and discomfort are the most common uh, adverse effects. better. Omega-3 carbox, carboxylic acids are a fish oil mixture of free fatty acids. Let me tell you why this is important. I've seen this show up a, a couple times um, where uh, the patient's cholesterol is mildly elevated. They really don't want to take meds. They want to, you know, do diet and exercise. And they ask, you know, is there something that, you know, I can do to also help? You know, you can uh, suggest over-the-counter fish oil. Caution needs to be used in patients with hepatic impairment or 
allergy to fish or shellfish. These capsules, can capsules ever be chewed? No, they're capsules. These capsules have to be swallowed whole, not cut, not crushed, not chewed. The drug may prolong bleeding time. So again, caution must be used with any other drugs that affect bleeding. Diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, and discomfort are the most common effects. Summary. Again, coronary artery disease is a leading cause of death in the Western world. The cause of coronary artery disease is understood, but many of the risk factors have been identified. What are they? And you have to know them. And when they pop up on select, on select, when they pop up on NCLEX, they usually pop up as select all that applies. So here's the risk factors, increasing age, male gender, genetic predisposition, high fat diet, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, obesity, high stress levels, bacterial infections, diabetes, hypertension, gout, and menopause. Fats are metabolized with the aid of bile acids. Oh. Yeah. Bile acids, which act as a detergent to break fats into small molecules called micelles. Cholesterol is important fat that is used to make bile acids. Isn't that ironic? It's the base for steroid hormones and it provides the necessary structure for cell membranes. All cells can produce cholesterol. Patients taking lipid-lowering drugs need to include diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes to reduce the risk of coronary artery disease. Let's jump to page 830. Bile acid sequestrants bind with bile acids in the intestine and leads to excretion through feces. The HMG, COA reductase inhibitors, also known as what? Statins. They block the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, and that lowers the serum cholesterol levels. The cholesterol absorption inhibitor azetamine works in the brush border of the small intestine to prevent the absorption of dietary cholesterol. And lastly, other agents used to lower cholesterol include fibrates. Make sure you know which drugs fall under the fibrates. Niacin, which is also known as what? Vitamin, Vitamin B or nicotinic acid. Very good. And omega-3 fatty acids. All right. Chapter 48. Drugs that affect coagulation. Okay, guys, so your first set of drug cards you're going to um, give me are your antiplatelet agents. You need to know which drugs fall under that category of antiplatelet agents. And what I wrote here, because this is important for you guys to know, because you have to be able to differentiate those actions, the antiplatelet agents, they decrease platelet formation, and, and which stops them from sticking together. If they don't stick together, they don't form what? Clots. Clots. Very good. Well, I don't know why I didn't put a star next to my aspirin. So make sure you know all of these drugs, especially uh, the aspirin and the clopid, clopid drug. Yeah, you guys see it. All right. That's my, the first one. The next drug, clark, drug card you guys are going to owe me are the anticoagulants. All these drugs that fall under the anticoagulants, make sure that you understand their anticoagulants, especially my heparin and my warfarin. Now with the anticoagulants, how do they work? They interfere with the clotting process. So where we have the antiplatelets, they decrease the platelet formation and they stop them from sticking together. The anticoagulants interfere with the actual clotting process. Drug card number three, thrombolytic agents. Thrombo, clots, lytic to break down. So they break down clots, that's what they do. 
Make sure you know all these drugs, especially the alteplase. Next, so that's one, two, three. Number four, the low molecular weight heparins. These stop clot formation. And that's important to know because I've seen it as many times where students, you'll think that they break down the clots. Uh-uh. They prevent the formation. But once that clot's already there, it's not going to break it down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Next drug card, the anticoagulant adjunctive therapy. So these are the drugs that are given with other, you know, anticoagulants, okay? And... Out of these, you had better know your protamine sulfate and your vitamin K. You better know those two and understand that they're given adjunctive therapy. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we have five drug cards so far. Let's jump to <laughs> key points, page 837. These are things we discussed already last week, but reminders. The conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, which results in insoluble fiber threads, is the final step of the clot formation. No, we didn't talk about this last week, but you guys should learn this in um, AMP. Next, to prevent the occlusion of blood vessels and the denying of blood to the tissues, a formed clot has to be dissolved. Because if that clot is there, guess what? Blood flow is going to decrease, and it might even cause occlusion of the entire, entire vessel. And God forbid that clot dislodges. It's now um, an embolism. It's moving, and it goes, to the, it goes to the lungs. The base of the clot dissolving system is the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin by several factors. Plasmin dissolves fibrin threads and resolves the clot. So um, if you guys don't remember any of that, go back to the previous pages. You guys went over that in the I'm not going to cover that again. Let's start with uh, thromboembolic disorders. Thrombo clots, embolic moving disorders, okay? Medical conditions that involve the formation of thrombi results in decreased blood flow through total occlusion, excuse me, through or total occlusion of a blood vessel, which makes sense if, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see. <coughs> excuse me. So take a look, guys. Imagine this is your vessel. It's only so big. Now you have a clot in there that's taking space of blood that is supposed to be traveling through, right? So absolutely, it can cause occlusion. These conditions are marked by the signs and symptoms of, you guys got to know these signs and symptoms, hypoxia, anoxia, or even necrosis in areas affected by the decreased blood flow. Because remember, one of the main things that the blood carries is what? Oxygen. In some of these disorders, pieces of the thrombus called the emboli can break off and travel through the cardiovascular system until they become lodged in a tiny vessel, plugging it up. God bless you. Conditions that predispose a person to the formation of clots and emboli are called thromboembolic disorders. Coronary artery disease, we talked about that already. Any patient with coronary artery disease, we know they're at risk for thromboembolic disorders. Hemorrhagic disorders. Hemorrhagic disorders in which excess bleeding occurs are less common than thromb thromboembolic disorders. These disorders include hemophilia. And you guys are going to learn more about hemophilia when you get to peds. But hemophilia, this is a genetic lack of clotting factors. Or the patient can have liver disease. That can cause them to have hemorrhagic disorders. Why? Remember, our clotting factors are made where? In the liver. That's why if, let's say the patient got in a car accident, something happened that we're rushing the patient to the ER, ER, the OR, the operating room. One of the main questions we have to know, when was the last time you had alcohol? Are you an alcoholic? Because that patient that is an alcoholic, they will literally bleed out on that, on that surgical bed, okay? Um, 
liver disease in which clotting factors and proteins needed for clotting are not produced, and bone marrow disorders. Think about it, guys. The bone marrow, that's where your blood cells are made, your WBCs, your RBCs, and your what? Your platelets. Wake up, guys. Come on. Your platelets, in which platelets are not formed. These disorders are treated with clotting factors and drugs that promote the coagulation process. Drugs affecting clot formation and resolution. So pa patient may get antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants, thrombolytic agents. All of these are drugs that affect the clot formation and resolution of the clot. So the first one we're going to talk about are the antiplatelet drugs. Antiplatelet agents decrease the formation of platelet plug by decreasing the responsiveness of the platelets to stimuli that would cause them to stick and aggregate on the vessel wall. So these antiplatelets prevent those platelets that are already there from sticking together and forming a clot. Make sure you know the drugs that fall under antiplatelet category. Therapeutic actions and indications. Antiplatelet agents inhibit. They stop platelet adhesion and aggregation by blocking receptor sites on platelet membranes, preventing platelet-platelet interaction. So not only do the antiplatelets stop the platelets from sticking to the vessel wall, it stops them from sticking to each other. Because if they stick to the vessel wall, that can form occlusion, right? And obviously, if it sticks together and forms a clot, that can form occlusion. Um, on these two pages, I just highlighted the drugs that falls under the different classes, which I already told you you need to know. So let's jump to page 840. We'll go to this box in a second. We're still talking about the antiplatelets. The prescriber's choice of drug depends on the intended use and the patient's tolerance that's associated with adverse effects. Let's talk about contraindications and cautions of antiplatelets. <clears throat> Obviously, if the patient has an allergy to antiplatelets, we're not going to give it. If they already have a bleeding disorder, does it make sense to give antiplatelets to a patient that has a bleeding disorder? No. no. If they had recent surgery, we're not going to give it. Think about it. Remember something I've told you guys. When you get a test question about a patient that came from surgery, I don't care what kind of surgery it was. I don't care if they got their spleen removed, they got an amputation, I don't care. The three biggest concerns you're always going to have after surgery is infection, DVT or pulmonary embolism, and hemorrhage, then bleeding out. So this type of patient, if they just had surgery, it makes no sense to give them an antiplatelet. Closed head injuries, history of smoke, smoke, history of stroke, <laughs> TIA. Remember TIA, those are like the mini strokes. Those are the big warnings to let you know that the stroke's coming, right? If the patient's pregnant, if they're breastfeeding. Anagrolyte should be used with caution in any, in a patient with any history of thrombocytopenia. Thromboclot, cytocellopenia, a little bit of. They have just a little bit of those clotting cells. Why? Because it decreases the production of platelets in the bone marrow. So that means you'd make the problem even worse. The platelets should be checked regularly to monitor for thrombocytopenia. When you guys see big words like that, just break it down. So if a patient's taking an antiplatelet drug, we have to keep checking their platelet count regularly. So Pinadryl Plavix has a black box warning for people who poorly metabolize a certain liver enzyme, CYP2C19. Adverse effects? There are lots of them. Bleeding. Increased bruising. Bleeding while brushing the teeth. So you're gonna tell that patient while you're on this medication, pay attention when you use a soft toothbrush, and when you're brushing your teeth, if you notice this pink tinge, blood tinge, let us know. Pay attention to your stools. Other common problems include headache, dizziness, weakness. 
The cause of these reactions is not understood. Nausea and GI distress can occur. Skin rash is another common effect, and it may be related to the direct drug effects on the dermis, on the skin. Drug-drug interactions. The risk of bleeding increases if any one of these drugs is combined with another drug that affects clotting. So if you were to give an antiplatelet with uh, aspirin or an NSAID or any other drug that can increase bleeding, you could, you're putting that patient at risk for hemorrhaging. Now, before we go to nursing considerations, let's go back to box 48.2. Take a look at this. Many herbal therapies can cause problems when used with drugs that affect blood coagulation. Patients taking these drugs should be cautioned to avoid, as you stay away from, angelica, cat's claw, chamomile, chondroitin, feverfew, garlic, how do you pronounce this, ginkgo or ginkgo? Ginkgo, golden seal, grape seed extract, green leaf tea, horse chestnut seed, psyllium, and turmeric. They should not be taking any of these if they're taking um, drugs that affect coagulation. All right, let's go to nursing considerations for antiplatelet drugs. Obviously, we're not going to administer if the patient has any known allergies, if they're pregnant, they're lactating. They have bleeding disorders. They had recent surgery, close head injury. If they're taking other drugs or herbs that I just mentioned, because that can affect their bleeding. We're going to get a baseline status on the patient. We're going to take vital signs. Implementation rationale, we're going to give small frequent meals, provide comfort measures. This is important. This is on um, NCLEX safety measures. Teach them to use an electrical razor. Avoid contact sports. You're going to see this again when you get to PEDS, and I promise you, I absolutely promise you that's going to be a test question for you. If you're a child has hemophilia, I'm so sorry. You are not playing soccer, basketball, football. You better go play golf or something but you can't play contact sports. Monitor the platelet count if the patient's using anagrelide. Because remember with that drug, anagrelide, um, it can uh, cause thrombocytopenia and increase the risk of bleeding even more. Provide increased precautions against bleeding during invasive procedures. Let me tell you something, if patients on the anticoagulant, you have to give an injection. You better put pressure on that side for sol on, on that site for a solid five minutes. Some books say 10, but I think yours says five. Use pressure dressings and ice to decrease the excessive blood loss. Mark in the patient's chart that they are on antiplatelets. Provide thorough patient teachings. Teach them that they need to wear a uh, carry a medic alert bracelet. So if they pass out or something happens, everyone can know that they're on antiplatelet drugs. All right, we're going from antiplatelets to anticoagulants. Let's talk about anticoagulants. Anticoagulants are drugs that interfere with the normal coagulation process by interfering with the clotting cascade and thrombin formation. These drugs include, and you see that list, make sure you guys know them, you have them on your drug card. Therapeutic actions and indications for anticoagulants. Where ferrin, an oral drug in this class, causes a decrease in the, in the production of vitamin K dependent clotting factors in the liver. Guys, vitamin K is the antidote for warfarin. And the way you remember that, Coumadin, Coumadin, K. What'd you say? <laughs> so you need to know that vitamin K is the antidote for Coumadin where protamine sulfate is the antidote for what? Caprin, very good. Caprin, ergatrivam, and bival... Someone pronounce this drug for me. Bivalrudin blocks the formation of thrombin from prothrombin. Because heparin must be injected, notice it said may. I mean, notice it doesn't say may, it says must, right? So it absolutely has to be injected. 
It is often not the drug of choice for outpatients who would be responsible for injecting the drug several times during the day. So let me ask you guys something. Can heparin be taken orally? No. It has to be what? Injected. Injected. Do you guys know the site? I am sub Q, sub Q, sub Q, okay? Patients may be started on heparin in an acute situation and then switch to an oral anticoagulant. Pharmacokinetics, you guys know I don't go over that much. If I go over it, that means it's important. You need to know it. Heparin is injected IV or sub-Q. Yeah, we can give it IV too. IV or sub-Q, and it has almost immediate onset of action. Warfarin's onset of action is about three days because remember, warfarin, that's the one that can be given by mouth, okay? Warfarin's onset of action is about three days. Its effect lasts for four to five days. Look at this, guys. Because of the time delay, warfarin is not the drug of choice in an acute situation. If there's an acute situation, we need something to work right away. We're going to give them heparin because remember, heparin, the onset is immediate. So it's not the drug of choice in an acute situation, but it is convenient and useful for prolonged effects. So in acute situation, we're going to give that patient heparin, and then, you know, as they're going to get discharged, they're going to get switched to Coumadin. And this is what's known as a bridge therapy, by the way. contraindications and cautions of anticoag anticoagulants, allergy to the drugs, we're not going to give. They should, they also should not be used with any condition that could be compromised by increasing bleeding tendencies, including, they're giving you the list, guys, you need to know this. Okay. Hemorrhagic disorders, recent trauma, Spinal puncture. The oral anticoagulants come with a black box warning of the risk of hemorrhage with spinal puncture or anesthesia. GI ulcers, recent surgery, intrauterine device placement, tuberculosis, the presence of an indwelling catheter, and threatened abortion. The oral anticoagulants are contraindicated in pregnancy if the woman's um, breastfeeding. If the person has renal hepatic disease, heparin does not enter breast milk, so it is an anticoagulant of choice if one is needed during lactation. So if the woman's breastfeeding and she absolutely needs an anticoagulant, we're going to give what? Heparin. Caution should be used in patients that have heart failure, thyrotoxicosis, senility, psychosis, diarrhea, fever. Caution should be used in pregnancy and lactation with anticoagulants other than warfarin. We're going to be uh, cautious in giving it to patients with renal failure, especially if you're, they're on a Pixaban. Adverse effect of anticoagulants. What's the first one? Bleeding. Bleeding. Guys, usually when you get a test question on a medication, they usually want to know if you know, one, what would happen if that medication works a little bit too well. So in this case, anticoagulant, what happens if that med works a little bit too well? Or if they get a toxic level of that drug? Bleeding, right? Or they'll want to know the indication of the drug. And you guys usually don't get that type of test question because it's too easy. Why is that drug being given? And thirdly, the adverse effects and nursing interventions for those adverse effects, okay? So anyway, with the anticoagulants, bleeding, ranging from bleeding gums with tooth brushing to severe internal hemorrhage. Patients need teaching about administration, disposal of syringes, and the signs of bleeding to watch out for. So you're going to have to do periodic bleeding tests. Clotting time should be monitored closely to avoid these problems. 
and the patient should also be monitored for warfarin overdose. Several of the newer oral anticoagulants have a black box warning about the risk for rebound thromboembolic events when the drugs are suddenly stopped. So we're giving these drugs to stop the patient from um, developing clots, but if they're suddenly stopped off this medication instead of being we uh, weaned slowly, look at what happened. They can have a rebound effect and the same medication that was supposed to stop them from clotting, now they're all of a sudden clotting. Okay, so we have to be careful for that. That's why they have to be weaned off and not stopped suddenly. These drugs also have a black box warning about the risk for spinal and epidural hematoma if used during spinal anesthesia or spinal puncture. Permanent paralysis has occurred. This is the second time the author said this. You think that's important to know? Okay. Vitamin K and prothrombin complex um, concentrate. So let's see what it says. There are times when warfarin effects must be reversed quickly. And so what's the antidote for warfarin? Vitamin K. Yes, vitamin K and prothrombin complex. You guys need to know that. Look at box 48.4. Injectable vitamin K is used to reverse the effects of warfarin. This is the third time they're telling us this. You're going to see it again. Look at box 48.5. In cases of a heparin overdose, the antidote is protamine sulfate. Vitamin K for warfarin, protamine sulfate for heparin. Warfarin has been associated with alopecia and dermatitis, as well as bone marrow depression, and less frequently prolonged and painful erections. <laughs> Nausea, GI upset, diarrhea, and hepatic dysfunction can also occur secondary to the direct uh, drug toxicity. Drug-drug interactions of the anticoagulants. Again, you guys notice how the first thing you guys keep seeing is bleeding. Increased bleeding can occur if heparin is combined with oral anticoagulants, such as Coumadin, salicylates, penicillin, or cephalosporins. Decreased, excuse me, decreased anticoagulation can occur if heparin is combined with nitroglycerin. That is on NCLEX. It's been seen on NCLEX very often. Decreased anticoagulation can occur if that heparin is combined with nitroglycerin. It's a wise practice to never add or take away a drug from the regimen of a patient receiving warfarin without careful patient monitoring and adjustment of the warfarin dose to prevent serious adverse effects. Dabigatrin, indoxaban, Ap, ap, oh, I hate this, apixaban <laughs> and rivaroxaban must be used with caution with antifungals, erythromycin, ritinavir, fentanyl, which is your dilantin, and rifampin because of alterations in metabolism. <laughs> so let's talk about nursing considerations for patients taking uh, anticoagulants. You're going to assess them for known allergies. You're going to screen them for conditions such as um, hemorrhagic disorders, recent trauma, spinal puncture, GI ulcers, because GI ulcers can bleed, right? Mm -hmm. Recent surgery, intrauterine device place, placement, tuberculosis. This is the second time we're seeing all this stuff, guys. Presence of indwelling catheters and threaten abortion. You're also going to screen the patient for pregnancy, renal hepatic disease, heart failure, thyrotoxicosis, diarrhea, fever, nursing implementation rationale. This is super important. You guys need to know. Don't say I did not warn you. You're going to evaluate for therapeutic effects on warfarin, PT of 1.5 to 2.5 times the control value or ratio of PT uh, excuse me, PT to INR of two to three. So PT 1.5 to 2.5, PT INR two to three. Oops, 
a PTT of 1.5 to three times control value. You're gonna evaluate the patient regularly for any sign of blood loss. And they give you examples. You know when they give examples in, in, in the book, that's important for you to know. What are those examples? Petechiae, bleeding gums, bruising, dark colored stools, dark colored urine. This is what you're gonna be assessing the patient for to see if they're getting a toxic level of this medication or adverse effects. Provide safety precautions. Prevent them from injury because this patient's gonna um, bleed easily. Teach them safety measures such as electric razor, no contact sports, precaution against bleeding during invasive procedures, use pressure dressings, avoid IM injections. If you have absolutely have to give an IM injection to a patient that um, is on an anticoagulant, you better put pressure on that side for at least five minutes. Do not rub sub Q injections. Make sure you mark in the patient chart that they're on anticoagulants. Maintain the antidotes on standby. If that patient's on Coumadin, you better have vitamin K very nearby. If they're on heparin, you better have proteomine sulfate very near. Is that very nearby? That's not good English, is it? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You know what I mean? You get it. All right. Ensure a switch to another anticoagulant if a Pixaban and Doxaban the bigotran or rivaboxan is stopped suddenly. Remember, we never want to stop those drugs suddenly. If it stops suddenly for any other reason other than pathological bleeding, because remember that can cause a, a rebound and cause them to start clotting. You're going to monitor a patient carefully when any drug or herb is added or withdrawn from the drug regimen of a patient that's taking warfarin. Teach them that they have to have regular follow-up visits, monitoring, including a measurement of clotting times. Make sure you do a complete patient assessment. Again, for warfarin, the PT of 1.5 to 2.5 control value. Warfarin PTN INR needs to be two to three. For heparin, 2.5 to three times the control value or AP, APTT of 1.5 to three. I know that's a lot of memorization. You better have it on your drug cards, by the way, because this is very important for you guys to know. Make sure it's on your drug card. You're going to monitor for adverse effects. All right. Now we're going to talk about thrombolytic agents. Do you guys need a 10-minute break? Or are you good? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. 10-minute break, and then we'll continue with thrombolytic agents. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Okay, guys. So let's talk about thrombolytic agents, um, drugs that actually break down the clot once that clot has already formed. So with the thrombolytic agents, they don't prevent the formation of clots. They actually break down the clot. They lyse the clot. Okay. Thrombolytic agents break down the thrombus that has been formed by stimulating the plasmid system. This process is called clot resolution. We've resolved the clot problem. We got rid of the clot. Thrombolytic agents include alteplase. You better make sure you know that one. Retoplase, and they give you the other drugs. Make sure you have it on your drug card. All right, let's talk about therapeutic actions and indications of thrombolytic agents. If a thrombus has, what does it say? already formed. If a thrombus has already formed in a vessel, probably during an MI, a stroke, a pulmonary embolism, whatever, it may be necessary to dissolve that clot to open up the vessel and restore blood flow to the dependent tissue. So they're making a point of letting you know the thrombolytic agents, they break down the clot. That clot has to already been formed. So they're letting you know that this medication does not prevent the formation of clots. And you guys have to absolutely understand that because I promise you'll be asked about it somewhere within your academic career, maybe with me. All of the drugs, <laughs> all of the drugs that are available for this purpose work to activate the natural anti-clotting system. Pharmacokinetics, when it comes to um, alteplase and those other thrombolytic agents, 
these drugs are given how? IV. IV. And they're cl cleared um, from the body after it's been metabolized in the liver. Contraindications and cautions. We're going to assess them for allergies to thrombolytic agents. We're going to assess them for any condition that could be worsened by the dissolution of, of the clot. So there are conditions where the patient has a clot, but breaking down that clot might cause them to have a worse condition. Well, what could that be? Here goes the list, guys. Recent surgery. Why? Did I not tell you that after patient has surgery, one of the biggest concerns we have is what? Hemorrhaging. Bleeding, hemorrhaging, right? Recent surgery, active internal bleeding. If a patient is actively bleeding and they have a clot, in that situation, the clot such a bad thing? No. It may not be because they're bleeding. We want the blood to start coagulating. We don't want them to bleed to death, right? CVA within the last two months. There's different types of strokes. The patient could have a hemorrhagic stroke in the brain, but they also could have had a, a stroke that was a clot that caused the, the, the vessel to burst, right? Aneurysm. Remember aneurysm? That's a weakness of the vessel. OB delivery. Organ biopsy, recent serious GI bleeding, rupture of a non-compressible blood vessel, recent major trauma, including CPR, known blood clotting defects, cerebrovascular disease, and uncontrolled hypertension in liver. So guys, those are the lists that we're going to have to be very careful because maybe we don't want to dissolve this clot, okay? Obviously, pregnancy, breastfeeding, we're going to um, give these drugs cautiously. Adverse effects of thrombolytic agents. What's the first thing you see? Bleeding. That can increase the patient's risk of bleeding, obviously, because you're breaking down that clot. Patients should be monitored closely for the occurrence of cardiac arrhythmias with coronary reperfusion and hypotension. So you guys can't memorize. It has to make sense to you. So you guys can get the correct answer right because there's no way you're going to be able to memorize anything. So everything I mean. So just think about it for a second. We're giving a thrombolytic agent or we've been ordered to give a thrombolytic agent. The list of conditions we see up here, it makes sense, guys, because we know what the thrombolytic agents do. It breaks down the clot, which can increase the bleeding risk. Aren't all of these conditions that we would not want that bleeding risk to be increased in the patient? Okay. Nursing uh, considerations for thrombolytic agents. You're going to assess them for any allergies. You're going to screen them for any conditions that could be worsened by the dissolution of clots. They're giving it to you again. You guys better know them. Recent surgery, active internal bleeding, CVA within the past two months, aneurysm, OB delivery, organ biopsy, recent serious GI bleeding, rupture from a non comp compressible blood vessel, recent major trauma, including CPR, known blood clotting defects, cerebrovascular disease, and uncontrolled hypertension. We're also going to um, give cautiously to any patient that has liver disease, pregnancy, lactation. We're going to make sure we take a baseline of the patient's status so we can know if the medications are actually being effective. We're going to assess their body temperature, skin color, lesions, temperature, especially looking at the skin, make sure they're not having bruising, right? Or signs and symptoms of internal bleeding. Implementation rationale. You're going to arrange to administer tissue plasminogen activators to reduce mortality associate, associated, associated with acute MI as soon as possible after the onset of symptoms. Look at what it says, guys because the timing for the administration of these drugs is critical, as in crucial, as in important to resolve the clot before permanent damage occurs to the myocardial cells. All right, so let's talk about this. And then in parentheses, I put less than three hours because I don't know why they didn't write it in the book, but NCLEX definitely expects you to know that. You want to give that TPN within um, a TPN. Um, 
plasminogen activator within three, three hours, okay? Now, here's what's important, and they didn't mention this, but I guess you guys are taking MedSurge right now, right? Yeah. Okay, have you guys covered this in MedSurge yet? Okay, so one of the things you're going to learn when you guys actually do cover it, it's important to know what kind of stroke that patient has, because think about it. If that patient had a hemorrhagic stroke, would we want to give tissue plasminogen to them? No. no. It would be for a stroke where the patient actually had a clot, so that's important to know. You're going to discontinue heparin if it's being given before administ administration of a thrombolytic agent unless specifically ordered for coronary artery infusion. And that makes sense. Why would you still be given that heparin when you're going to be given that thrombolytic agent? Evaluate the, evaluate the patient for any signs of blood loss. And they're giving you the examples. This is what you're going to be looking for. Petechiae, bleeding gums, bruising, dark colored stools, dark colored urine. When you see the author keeps repeating themselves over and over, it's not because they want to waste ink. It's because this is important. You're most likely going to see it on an exam. You're going to monitor coagulation studies. You're going to institute treatment within six hours after the onset symptoms of acute MI. You're going to type it cross match if the patient is going to need blood, monitor cardiac rhythm, provide increased precautions against bleeding during invasive procedures. Use pressure dressings and ice. Avoid IM injections. Do not rub sub-Q side of injection. Make sure you mark in that patient's chart that they're on thrombolytic agents. Other drugs that affect clot formation. So you guys need to know which other drugs they are. They're your low molecular weight heparins, your anticoagulant adjunctive therapy, and your hemorrhagic agents. Back read on that. Sorry, it wasn't on the screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which, these? You just, you just had to read on that one. Yes, just read on it. Yeah, same thing I just highlighted. Okay. Oh, wow. All right, drugs used to control bleeding. So we're not trying to... Um, we're not... Let me back up. I'm not going to say what I'm going to say. So let's talk about drugs used to control bleeding. So on the other end of the spectrum of coagulation problems are various bleeding disorders. So we went from talk about all these disorders that were clotting disorders, right, where we were trying to prevent those clots. Now we're talking about bleeding disorders where you know what, clot is such a bad thing, right? Let's talk about this. They include hemophilia. Hemophilia in which there is Again, you guys see this? Genetic. That's important for you guys to know. This is genetic lack of clotting factors that leaves the patient vulnerable to excessive bleeding with any injury. Liver disease. Remember, the clotting factors are made in the liver. Bone marrow disease. Remember, our platelets are made where? In the bone marrow. So you guys need to understand any patient that has hemophilia, any patient that has liver disease, any patient that has bone marrow disease, automatically that's going to put them at risk for bleeding. Anti-hemophilic agents. The drugs used to treat hemophilia are replacement factors because remember, the, things with, the thing with the patient that has hemophilia, they're missing the clotting factor. So what we're giving them is the clotting factor, okay? The drugs used to treat hemophilia are replacement factors for the specific clotting factor that are generally missing in that particular type of hemophilia. These drugs include anti-hemophilic factor, and they give it down the list. Make sure you guys read that on your own. We're going to talk about therapeutic actions and indications. The anti-hemophilic drugs replace clotting factors that are either genetically missing or low in a particular type of hemophilia. You guys know this. They could have just said uh, factors that are missing, but they put that word genetically in there on purpose because they are reminding you when it comes to hemophilia, this is a genetic disorder. 
You're going to see this again in peas. The drug of choice depends on whichever clotting factor they're missing. Antihemophilic factor is factor eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, factor eight. The clotting factor that's missing in classic, ding, 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 classic hemophilia, which is hemophilia A. You absolutely have to know this in peas. It's going to be a test question. Both, peas and here. <laughs> if I'm talking about it, you need to know it for my class. So with hemophilia A, which clotting factor are they missing? A. A. And so that's the one we're going to be replacing. And I wrote no here. So no excuses. Got to know it. Pharmacokinetics. These agents replace the normal clotting factors and are processed as such by the body. They must be given IV. It didn't say may. There's no choice. It has to be given how? Okay. IV. Very good. Contraindications and cautions. Look at this, guys. Antihemophilic factor is contraindicated in the presence of known allergy to mouse proteins. Well, <laughs> factor nine is contraindicated in the presence of liver disease with signs of intravascular coagulation or fibrinolysis. Coagulation factor seven is contraindicated with known allergies to mouse, hamster, or bovine products. These drugs are not recommended during pregnancy, lactation. It's recommended that another method of feeding the baby be used if these drugs are needed during lactation. Adverse effects. The most common adverse effect associated with anti-hemophilic agents involve risk associated with the use of blood products, such as hepatitis and AIDS. Headache. Flushing, chills, fever, lethargy can occur as a reaction to the injection of a foreign protein. Remember, anytime something foreign is introduced into your body, you have something called an immune system, right? And they'll recognize that invader and that might cause another set of problems. Nausea and vomiting can also occur, as may stinging, itching, and burning at the site of injection. Nursing considerations for anti-hemophilic agents. You're going to assess the patient for allergies to any of the drugs or to mouse proteins with anti-hemophilic factor and liver disease. You're going to assess the patient's baseline, assess their body temperature, skin, color, lesions. Implementation rationale. You're going to ensure that appropriate clotting factor is being used. Does it make sense if the patient's missing clotting factor nine, but we're giving them seven? Is that going to help them at all? No. You're going to administer by IV route only to ensure therapeutic effectiveness. We're going to monitor clinical response and clotting factor levels, monitor patients for any signs of thrombosis. To, excuse me, to arrange to use comfort. Guys, I'm sorry. Monitor the patient for any signs of thrombosis to arrange to use comfort and support measures as needed. They're giving you those uh, support measures. Support hose, positioning, ambulation, exercise. You know the support hose, so the, the tight, tight, tight stockings that push the blood back up to the heart? Decrease the rate of infusion if headache, chills, fever, or stinging occurs because the patient's having a, a, a drug reaction. Arrange to type and cross-match blood in case they have to get blood transfusion. Mark the chart so everybody can know that they're receiving this drug. You're going to provide thorough patient teaching. All right, we're moving on to hemostatic agents. Hemostatic agents are used to stop bleeding. Hemostatic drugs may be either systemic or topical. They're used to step, um, the hemostatic drug that's used systemically is Amicar. Topical hemostatic agents include, and they give you the list, just make sure you guys take a look at that. 
Everything else on those hemostatic agents, you can read on your own. I'm not saying it's not important. I just haven't seen it in NCLEX in all my years of teaching. So, maybe I know. But let's jump to the bottom of page 855. A couple things that you do need to know about the hemostatic agents. Remember, they stop bleeding. Sorry, 856. Page 856. You're going to assess them for any known allergies. You're going to assess them for acute DIC. You guys are going to, have you guys learned about DIC yet in med surge? So it's like a horrible domino, no, a horrible cycle where they clot, then bleed, clot, then bleed, clot, then bleed. So one second, you're literally treating them for the clotting, then you're treating them for the bleeding. And it's not you that's doing it. You know how we'll give a patient medication and, you know, the medication works too well or it's an adverse effect? No, in this situation, it's their body that's doing it. So you're running from clotting, bleeding, clotting, bleeding, and you're trying to control it. And use very often patients who have DIC, they end up dying just because of this. That's what's happening, okay? So anyway, um, you're going to assess them, obviously, for DIC because if they're clotting, then bleeding, clotting, then bleeding, how smart is it to give this type of medication? Where it, I mean, it's really, really hard. It's like they go like this on you. Um, yeah, the, the, the doctors and nurse practitioners kind of don't like you when you have this type of patient because you're calling them all the time. You know what I mean? Right. Um, assess them. Be cautious with lactation. You're going to monitor. Let's go down here to implementation. You're going to monitor the critical, excuse me, clinical response and cl clotting factor levels. Monitor the patient for any signs of thrombosis. And again, guys, you're going to give supportive measures such as a support holds, positioning, and make sure they're walking around, make sure they're exercising. Summary, some important summary to know. Once a clot is formed, it must be dissolved to prevent the occlusion of blood vessels and loss of blood supply to tissues. Because let me tell you something, if those tissues don't get the oxygen that's carried in the blood for long enough, they start to die. They become what? The clot. Plasminogen is the basis of the clot dissolving system. Anticoagulants block blood coagulation by interfering with one or more of the steps involved in coagulation. Thrombolytic drugs actually dissolve that clot or thrombus. They don't prevent them, they break them down. Hemostatic drugs stop bleeding. And hemophilia is a genetic, remember genetic, it's a genetic lack of essential clotting factors and is treated by replacing whichever clotting factor that that patient happens to be missing. Taking a deep breath. Mm. <laughs> Do we have 49 on our outline today? Yeah. Let's see if 23. Oh, I'll have yeah. Really, guys? Really? Yeah. But you're the one supposed to Chapter 49. Come on, come on. We have 30 more minutes. You guys can do it. Oh, you guys are such whiners. Jeez. That's a lot. That's like 80 pages. <laughs> no, I think anemia is very short. Hmm. Anemia. All right, we're going to start with anemia and we're, we'll finish up next week. So I'm not going to rush through it. All right, drug cards. This one, I think this makes number four, five, six. 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 Cheers. Six. Excuse me, number six. <laughs> All right, number six, I want you to give me the erythropoiesis stimulating agents. Number seven, I want you to give me the agents given for um, anemia, iron deficiency anemia, excuse me. Number eight, agents used for other anemias, especially make sure you guys um, know your vitamin B12, the ones that end in the cobalamin, okay? And then the last one, 
that was the last one. The last one is the agent for sickle cell anemia. That's this one, the hydroxyurea. You have to know, okay? Mm -hmm. I know, it's just the end of the world. All right, let's jump to page 862. Everything before this was reviewed. You guys learned this in AP. I'm not covering that again, but I'll go over the few points that you need to know. RBCs are produced where? In the bone marrow, along with your other blood cells, your WBCs, your platelets. The bone marrow uses iron, amino acids, carbohydrates, folic acid, and vitamin B12 to produce those healthy RBCs. And that's why if a patient um, doesn't have enough iron, obviously they don't have enough RBCs. Well, the RBCs aren't healthy because we need those, we need iron to make those RBCs. Anemia is a state of having too few RBCs, or maybe you have enough RBCs, they're just not effective. Anemia can be caused by a lack of eryth erythropoietin or a lack of the components needed to make the RBCs. Remember what those components are, the iron, the amino acids, the carbs, the folic acid, all that good stuff. Anemia can be ca categorized as deficiency, such as your iron deficiency anemia, megaloblastic, such as your folic acid or your B12 deficiency, or hemolytic, that one is your sickle cell. So we're gonna start with erythropoiesis stimulating agents because these drugs will help increase the RBCs and make those RBCs effective, okay? Patients who are no longer able to produce enough erythropoietin in the kidneys may benefit from treatment with exogenous erythropoietin. Remember that word exogenous means from an outside source. So we're giving it to them. When agents are used to stimulate the bone marrow to make more RBCs, it is important to ensure that the patient has enough levels of the components required to make RBCs, including adequate iron. The poetin alpha, so we're talking about the actions and indications of the erythropoiesis stimulating agents. The poetin alpha stimulates production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. This drug's indicated in the treatment of anemia associated with renal failure. Think about it, and it makes sense, guys, because it's the kidneys that produce what? The erythropoietin. So it's indicated in treatment of anemia that's associated with renal failure and for patients on dialysis, for anemia associated with AIDS therapy, and for anemia associated with ca uh, cancer chemotherapy when the bone marrow is depressed and the kidneys may be affected by the toxic drugs. So the kidney's not working, not making uh, the erythropoietin, not sending any signals to the bone marrow to make more RBCs. It is not approved to treat other anemias and is not a replacement for whole blood in the emergency treatment of anemia. So you need to know what it's used for and then what absolutely cannot be used for. Page 864, pharmacokinetics. They, they can be given IV or sub-Q. Contraindications and cautions. The drugs are contraindicated in the presence of uncontrolled hypertension because of the risk of even further hypertension when the RBC numbers increase. Think about it. We're giving this drug to increase the RBCs, which is going to make the drug thicker, right? which drug thicker, which is going to make the blood thicker, right? Which is going to cause um, more fluid volume, right? And doesn't that more, that's not good English, doesn't that more fluid, won't that <laughs> increase fluid volume cause more pressure pushing against the vessels? And is it increased pressure against the vessels? Isn't that what high blood pressure is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it makes sense. We're not going to give if the patient has any allergies or hypersensitivity. They can't take it if they're um, breastfeeding. There are no adequate studies in pregnancy, so you should be limited to those situations in which the benefits clearly outweigh the, um, the, the risks. 
Use caution when administering any of these drugs to patients with normal renal functioning and adequate levels of erythropoietin. Why would we give it if the kidney's working properly? Because if we do give it and the kidneys are working properly, they can have a rebound decrease in erythropoietin. Adverse effects, CNS effects such as headache, fatigue, asthenia, dizziness, cardiovascular symptoms such as hypertension, edema, possible chest pain, serious cardiovascular effects and increased risk for DVT have been seen when hemoglobin becomes higher than 11. Patients receiving IV administration must also be monitored for possible clotting of the access line related to direct cellular effects of the drugs. So it can place the patient at risk for clotting. Rapid growth of cancer is seen when hemoglobin becomes higher than 11. So they just gave us two very important reasons to make sure we're watching those hemoglobin levels. And if we creep, see it creeping up to 11, we got to reach out to the doctor. If it's 11, are we going to give this medication? We're going to hold and call the physician. Okay, we're going to do the nursing considerations for the erythropoiesis stimulating agents, and then I'll let you guys go for lunch because you look like you're about to die. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So nursing considerations for patients receiving erythropoiesis stimulating agents, you're going to assess them for allergies, severe hypertension, because remember, it's going to increase the blood volume, right? Um, lactation, it's used cautiously in patients with anemia and normal renal function because it can cause rebound decrease in the normal erythropoietin levels. Okay, and patients with cancer receiving the drugs to increase hematocrit after anti-neoplastic chemotherapy. So we gotta be very careful with this drug. Implementation rationale. Confirm the chronic renal nature of the patient's anemia before giving the drug. Remember, the whole reason that we're giving it is because the kidney's not functioning properly and that kidney is responsible for what? The erythropoietin. Give epitin alpha three times per week, either IV or sub-Q, because those are the only two ways it can be given. Administer darbapoetin Darba alpha once per week, sub-Q or IV. Provide the patient with a calendar of marked days so they can remember which days they have to take their medication. Do not mix with any other drug solution. You're going to monitor the access lines because remember that the access lines are a risk for them of developing clots in that area. So make sure you're assessing very closely. If the patient does not respond within eight weeks of drug therapy, reevaluate the cause of anemia. Anticipate a target hemoglobin of what? 11. Bad things can happen when it passes 11. Evaluate iron stores before and periodically during. We're doing it before because we need to make sure we're going to establish the baseline. And remember, iron has to be present for um, the patient to have that increased RB season for them to be effective. Yeah, more than to get to 11, but no, more than no 11. higher than 11. Monitor the blood. Let me back up. I want to explain to you why, so it makes sense to you. Remember, RBCs carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. So we need them to have enough so that the tissues are perfused, but not too much. So we don't have those adverse effects. So it's like a balancing act, but that's why. Okay. Um, where was I? Here. Oh, thank you. You're going to monitor their blood pressure because remember, as those RBCs increase, fluid volume increase, more pressure against the vessels, blood pressure can go up. So we're going to monitor for that. 
maintain seizure precautions on standby in case seizures occur as a reaction to the drug. Remember, have you guys done seizures in a Metzger jet? So let me tell you now, seizure precautions, you better make sure that the bed is in the lowest uh, position. Side rails are up. You have that patient at the end of the hall, not next to the nurse station where, you know, all of this foolishness is going on. You're going to make sure that you have dim lighting. You're going to make sure that you have low noise, right? You're going to make sure that... Um, that there's a pad on the floor and that the side rails are padded in case they have a seizure in the bed. All that good stuff. Key points. I know all that good stuff. That's not real professorly of me, is it? <laughs> Again, guys, look, these drugs must be given. Or there's only two ways you can give it. How? IV or sub Q. That's it. Must be given IV or sub Q. Patients must have an adequate supply of the other components, including iron, for the drugs to be effective. How many times have we seen this? A million. That means it's important for you guys to know. You guys can give this drug all you want. If they don't have enough iron, guess what? This patient's going nowhere when it comes to those RBCs. The target hemoglobin level no more than what? 11. Higher levels are associated with increased risk for cardiovascular events and increased tumor growth in cancer patients. All right, guys, that's it for today. Next week, we'll continue with agents used for iron deficiency.